Good morning. What a beautiful morning to greet you here as we come to worship God. For the Sundays that have been rainy and the Sundays that have been cold and today's a beautiful day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. If you're a visitor, we're especially pleased that you have come to worship with us. We love for you to visit with us and you'll soon learn that you're one of us because we cherish your presence. We make you feel that as we worship together, we are true brothers and sisters. If you should be a newcomer to our community, we invite you to become a full part of the program and activities of our church. One moment in history is blacker than all other black moments of history combined. That moment occurred on the day that Christ died it wasn't the driving of nails into his palms. That was painful. But there's been greater suffering than that in the world. It was not the pressing of thorns into his brow. That too has been surpassed many times by those who have suffered accidents to their bodies. It wasn't the crying for his crucifixion on the part of the people he loved. Most of us have felt betrayal at one time or another. It wasn't the spear thrust into his side. It was too late for him to feel that pain. But there was a moment, a moment that is beyond description as to its pain, its heartbreak. It was the moment when God left Christ and he was all alone. And Christ in the terror of that realization, in the hurt of that moment, cried out in agony that we can only imagine, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A sense of being forsaken by God is the blackest moment any one of us can know. Sometimes we feel as we struggle through one problem and difficulty that God has left us. But the realization of that possibility staggers the imagination. The fact that God could possibly leave us is more than we can bear. <laughs> We can keep him at arm's length, and many of us do. But for God to leave us, the sun broke over the banks of the Thames River in London. If you had been there, you wouldn't have known that the sun had risen. The black had just become gray because of the falling rain and of the fog that lifted off the river. And as the sun became brighter through the gray mist, forms could be seen on the banks of that river, moving from asleep, standing upright, stretching and sauntering about. One of these was a young man just in his twenties. He had slept there on the banks of the river under a makeshift shelter because there was no, one, no place else for him to go. Here's where the refuse of the city came together and spent the night. He had tried not to be the refuse of the city. He had tried to earn some money by which to live. He had tried to sell matches, but he couldn't sell them. For a while he tried to sell newspapers, but there were those more agile than he who rushed to claim the pence from those who bought the papers and he was left carrying his own. The last coin that he had earned had come from holding the head of a horse while the owner had stepped away for a few moments and he had spread it out as far as he could. But for now he had to grab food wherever he could find it. 
his shoes were worn so that his toes were visible through the shoes, and his clothes had become ragged, and they were filthy with dirt. His hair was long and stringy, and beard fell from his face. But if you had searched his cloak, you would have been surprised to find a book of poems by William Blake, and you would have found that the book was dog-eared from having been read much. And also in that tattered garment would be a piece of soiled paper on which awkward pencil marks had been drawn. He would somehow find his way to a post office. He would cram that piece of paper marked with pencil marks into the envelope, drop it in a slot, and address it to one of the publishers of London. And there it would fall upon his desk. And the publisher, looking at that piece of paper, would quickly pass it off to one of the secretaries, saying, dispose of this in one way or another. But the inquisitiveness of that secretary would tear open the parcel and would read the paper and the marks that had been written upon it. And the secretary would explode into the office of the publisher and said, you must read this. And when he had completed reading it, he sprang from his chair, rushed to where the envelope lay to see if a return address could be found. This was the most magnificent piece of poetry his eyes had ever fallen upon. He said, we've got to find the person who gave birth to these words. There was no return address. He published it, hoping that by its being published, the man who wrote it would come forth. It was a short time afterwards that the name of the author was announced to the publisher. He was ushered into the office, and the publisher rose to greet him, and then he pulled back. He couldn't believe that from such a creature as this, such beautiful words could have been written. And he led him over to a chair, and he waited to hear his story. It was the son of a physician whose father dreamed for his son the profession that he himself had followed. He and the boy's mother had saved the money over the years to give him an education, to train him to become a physician. And the young man had gone off to college. He had spent eight years in college. But at the end of every year came the report that he had failed his work. And finally, the father called him in faced him with the poor record that he had made, sensed that the young man was drinking, condemned him for having been drinking, and drove him out of the house, telling him that he could no longer do anything for him, that he'd wasted all of the money that his parents had set aside, had wasted his life, and there was nothing more that they could do for him. And so the young man left and walked out into the streets. But the story was different, because before his mother had died, she had given him a book. It was called The Confessions of an Opiate Smoker. He had read the delusions that the author had written about. It appeared that an entirely new world had been opened to one who would dare take opium into their system and allow their minds to exaggerate reality. And so he did. He experimented it with it to see what would be the result, only to discover that he was addicted from the first puff. And so he became addicted to opium, and that's why he ended up in the streets, a derelict, trying to feed his habit while not feeding his body. It totally destroyed his health, took away his mental agility, and just about had taken his life until he determined that he was going to break the habit and make his way back. And it was on his struggle back that he found a piece of paper and he began to write about what he had experienced and he titled it, The Hound of Heaven. And the man who wrote it was Francis Thompson. The literary critics say was one of the greatest literary geniuses that England had ever produced. He said in the Hound of Heaven, 
I ran down the days and down the nights. I ran down the arches of the years. I ran down the labyrinthian depths of my mind and I hid from him in my tears. But I never escaped him. He was always like a hound at my heels. I was never alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. No, never alone. never to leave me, never to leave me alone. I've seen the lightning flashing and heard the thunder roll. i felt since breakers dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I've heard the voice of Jesus telling me still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone, no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Of all the promises that may have been the best, the promise that God would never leave us, never leave us to ourselves. As John Wesley lay dying, his last words were these, and best of all, God is with us. And with that affirmation, we find the courage to live. With that affirmation, we discover the possibilities that otherwise could never be ours. We may leave God, but he will never leave us. When God is with us, our loneliness lifts. Hardly is there anything more devastating than to be lonely, to feel that one is cut off entirely from all else, an island unto ourselves. And those moments come, perhaps briefly, but those moments have come to all of us. But we have the realization that it is not true that we are not really alone because God has promised, Lo, I am with you always. And that's the promise to live by. We all need the companionship of other people. And when we're cut off from the companionship of other people, there is a loneliness that we have to deal with. But there is a loneliness far greater than that, and that is the inner loneliness, that sense of emptiness that comes even when we are surrounded by people, that emptiness that we find within ourselves even though Persons are crowded around us with all sorts of activity of which we can be a part. And that kind of loneliness is the worst of all. And that's the kind of loneliness that God dispels. She had lived to be almost 90 years. And the last 20 years of her life had been lived alone. No children. Her husband had died. She had a comfortable home, and there she stayed day by day. There was a nephew who didn't amount to much. He took her for almost everything that she had out of her earthly wealth. But he would come and bring her groceries and meet other needs that had to be met. 
From time to time, friends would drop in and sit by her fireplace. But most of the time, she was by herself. And I sat there on that winter evening, and I sensed the quietness that was almost overwhelming there in the house. I looked around and saw that nothing was ever moved from one visit to the next. And out of curiosity, I said, doesn't it get awfully lonely at times? And she said quickly, oh, no. I enjoy having people to talk with and to be around, but I'm never lonely because I'm so full inside. My Lord is always with me, and we spend such good time together. It is the presence of God that enables us to have within ourselves the qualities that make life worth living. And while we can reflect friendships and involvements and activities on the outside of our lives, some of the loneliest people in the world are those who have the most to keep them company but have not let God come on the inside. That kind of loneliness only God can dispel, not friends, because friends aren't forever. Not activities, because we weary of activities. But God present in our lives gives magnitude to our emotions, gives flight to our thoughts, gives dreams to our days ahead, gives substance to the things that others only hope about. God, present in our lives, lifts all true loneliness and leaves us filled. God in our lives takes away all hopelessness. We speak often of things being hopeless, but they really aren't. That which we experience in this life are going to fade in eventuality, no matter how great they may be at the moment, how awesome they may appear as necessary for our living. But the very nature of our life is such that everything that we experience through our senses is going to be taken from us. And if we built our trust on those things, we truly have nothing to live for. We are hopeless, but there are treasures on the inside that are far more important. The treasure that comes from interrelating with other people and making their lives a part of us and our lives a part of them, of knowing that because there's something that we have done, someone's life is made better. And because of the secret of life that we possess, we can give life to other people. When that great missionary Livingston returned to his home in Scotland, after being in Africa for a dozen years, he was an emaciated form of the person who left. His friends wouldn't have known him. He had suffered through 26 fevers. His arm hung lifeless at his side because of an attack by a lion. He told them of what he had done in Africa, surrounded by natives, oftentimes left alone in the jungle. And finally, one couldn't wait any longer and blurted out, how could you live in such isolation as that? How could you live in a country that was totally alien to everything that you are? How could you live surrounded by people who were different from you? And he answered quickly, Christ was with me all the time. It was he who made it possible. It was he who made it a thing to be desired. No, I never felt alone. I never felt lonely because I remembered the promise of my Lord and he fulfilled that promise in me. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And it is a companionship that makes our relationships with other people more vivid and more alive. When we love one another, strengthened by our love for Christ, it is a lasting love. It is a strong and vibrant love. But Christ left out of our relationships leaves us vulnerable and allows for the possibility of losing what we have. 
We've been reminded a number of times of the terrible concentration camps of Nazi Germany as the Hebrew nation has tried to keep alive the consciousness of people of the terrible things that happened under Adolf Hitler. But there weren't just Jews who were put in those concentration camps. There were others as well. One Protestant minister by the name of Francis Snyder. He was in prison because he was one who witnessed for Christ when told that he couldn't. It would have been so easy for him to escape it. It was not a political crime, it was a religious crime for which he had been imprisoned, but he stood on the principles that he lived by. And now he wrote a letter to his wife. How I wish we could be together. How I dream of the times we spent and the things that we shared. But it is not to be. You are free and I am in prison. But God is here with me. And we have shared our love and our love for God. And because he is here, I feel you here too. And so I put my trust in him. I share my time with him knowing that by sharing my time with him, I'm sharing my time with you. And if perchance we are never to be together again in this life, Remember, our love is eternal. And our love in Him assures us that we will be together again. And that was the last letter she received before he was taken to the gas chamber and his life taken along with the rest. God here lifts our hopelessness and gives us hope beyond that anything in the world can generate. And God present with us can enlarge our horizons so that nothing is impossible for our doing if it is a deep wish within our hearts and it is worthy of God's blessing. We're so crippled by living in a world that has not recognized the authority and the place of God in the world Every day we are retarded by that which others impose upon us that is unchristlike, that is inconsistent with the calling of our lives. We live in an imperfect world and we will struggle in an imperfect world. But Paul shared with us that though the obstacles seem far beyond anything that he could accomplish, with Christ I can do anything. And in reality, it is not I who does it, but it is Christ doing it in me. The realization that anything can happen, anything can be accomplished, anything can be done by God, and God's promise that if we'll let him, he'll do it through us. If God is absent from our lives and we become lonely, and if in the absence of God from our lives, we become powerless. And if in the absence of God from our lives, our dreams are restricted only to the moment and we feel the hopelessness of a world that is out of step with us, the simple answer is to let him in. Because he's there, waiting. One of the most exciting stories in the New Testament has to do with three young Hebrews who believed that God would keep his promise and they found themselves in exile and they couldn't be faithful in the way that they wanted to be, but they did it the best way they could. And then when Nebuchadnezzar gave an edict that they were to violate their dietary laws and they were to violate their confidence in God, they refused to budge and they were bound and thrown into a fiery furnace. And the story becomes electric with these words. And Nebuchadnezzar sprang to his feet and he said, I do not see the three bound that were thrown into the fiery furnace. I see them loose and I see a fourth person with them. That's what the famous English explorer said as they came out of Antarctica and became lost. 
And for months they searched to find their way over the glaciers and over the mountains. And the two who struggled together finally were saved. And when finally comforted and fed and brought to their strength again, as they came, they spoke these words to one another almost in unison. Wasn't it marvelous how we felt that there was a third person with us? And Captain Eddie Rickenbacker, who was shot down in World War II after having become the great ace of World War I, floated, drifted on the Pacific for days and days, and at the point of death, they were finally saved. But he said in the book that he wrote on his experiences, we never felt alone. We always knew that there was another person present. Dreams beyond our realization so fanciful that we dare not even consider the possibility. Too many have affirmed it in their lives for us to say no. That we are never alone when we let him in. He's always with us. And now this. We were not made to live in one dimensional world. We were made to live in companionship with God. He created us for himself and left apart from the creator who gives us the dimension of living that makes it all worthwhile. Life becomes empty, lonely, and ultimately lost. But here are the words of promise. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. We never need walk alone. And now, dear friends, go in peace and may God's peace and presence fill your life from this day forth. <laughs>